This video is about the play Philoctetes, written by Sophocles. Um, Philoctetes was the Job character of ancient Greek um, mythology storytelling. Um, <clears throat> he was a decent guy. He did everything well. And one day he accidentally walked on the sacred groves of Artemis and he was bitten on the ankle by a snake and the snake bite is extremely painful and it will never go away and it drains pus that really stinks and um, Philoctetes was such a good guy that he actually helped uh, Heracles out, Hercules, whatever, he helped him out at one point, and so um, Heracles gave Philoctetes a golden bow. Um, so that was the bow that uh, Philoctetes used to kill animals so he could eat. Then he was on the ship on the way to the Battle of Troy, and his sore, his wound, uh, stunk so much and he moaned about it so much that he was left on the island of Lemnos. Odysseus was in charge and left him alone with his bow on the island. So Philoctetes has now been living there for 10 years and the oracle from the gods has said that the Achaeans will not win the war unless Odysseus can get Philoctetes to come willingly and march, lead the troops in the battle, and then they will win. Okay, this is, it makes perfect sense that Philoctetes would be a great inspiration to the soldiers and they would fight better because Philoctetes suffered so much. He suffered at the hands of the gods, and he suffered at the hands of his friends, just like Job. Um, he got to the point where he had nothing left, and he was had, you know, this awful sore. So, um, the, okay, so it makes sense that if you're gonna win a war, if Philoctetes were in the front lines, all the soldiers, uh, instead of being afraid of dying or being afraid of suffering, they would think, oh, well, Philoctetes has suffered so much, and if he is still willing to forgive and forget, if he is still fighting bravely, if he is taking the risk of going to the front lines, then I shouldn't certainly have nothing to feel sorry for myself about. So definitely it makes sense that having Philoctetes in the front would inspire the soldiers and they would win. The other important point is that he was supposed to come willingly. All right, when Odysseus goes to get him, Odysseus assumes, he starts out saying, well, my choices. What were my choices for how to get Philoctetes to come? Of course, he knows Philoctetes hates him. And um, he decides that Philoctetes is not going to come willingly uh, if Odysseus just tries to argue with him. So Odysseus' choices, he describes, are force, fraud, or persuasion. And Odysseus decides he can't use persuasion. So what he does is he asks Neoptolemus, the son of Achilles, a young man, to go to Philoctetes and lie to him and say that Odysseus is a nasty guy and has done this horrible thing to him. And I can't even remember quite what the lie is, but the result would be that if Philoctetes believed 
the lie, he would come with Neoptolemus, uh, assuming he was coming for a different reason, and he would come onto the ship, and it, by the time he figured it out, it would be too late, and he would be on the ship, and he would go to Troy. Okay, so Odysseus speaks to Neoptolemus and asks, tells him about the plan to get him to deceive Neoptolemus, so Neoptolemus will come with him, or if he can't get him to come, it's good enough, Odysseus decides it's good enough to get the bow. Um, the trouble is, that's a completely bad interpretation of the oracle, because Philoctetes is not going to help the troops win because of his bow. It was because it was he that was in the front lines, and he and all of his suffering was going to inspire the soldiers. So Odysseus completely misinterpreted what the oracle was talking about, and he decided, first of all, he didn't have to persuade uh, Philoctetes, and second of all, he didn't even have to bring Philoctetes, he just had to bring the bow. Both of them are entirely wrong. But he asked Neoptolemus to do it. Now, Neoptolemus was very surprised because at the beginning of the play, he trusts his elders. He trusts Odysseus and he trusts uh, Philoctetes. By the end of the play, he doesn't trust either one of them. He disagrees with both of them. So he has a coming of age experience. He makes the transition from um, following, being ruled, to being able to exercise authority and to rule. He makes, eventually, every young person has to make that transition. Um, it should be under better circumstances than this. But uh, eventually, Neoptolemus is the one that has the best judgment. But at first, he says to Odysseus, um, I'm the son of Achilles, and I come from a noble line of people, and I was taught not to lie. Lying is not noble. It's ignoble, and I don't want to um, betray or undermine my family tradition. And Odysseus, um, makes it clear that he has decided the end, the end justifies the means. So he has calculated, he's used what Aristotle calls the calculative faculty to figure out the most efficient means to his goal, even if it's not a good goal, or even if in this case it's a good goal, but it's the wrong means. Um, so Odysseus gets into a conversation with Neoptolemus. And what he does is an archetype. Every young person, if they are going to succeed in society, they have to gain the goodwill and trust of the middle-aged, powerful generation. Um, and that's just, it's, it's ambition, but it's rational ambition. I mean, you can't do anything unless you're accepted into society. Otherwise, you're a total outcast. So, <clears throat> but in a good society, what you'll be asked to do is legitimate, work hard at some respectable profession, um, gain expertise, um, be given authority based on merit, uh, things like that. But in a bad society, the rulers will um, use the youth and they will um, play to their weaknesses. So Odysseus knows that Neoptolemus needs social honor, social respect, and he tells him, if you don't do this, I have the power to make you disrespected, um, to make it very difficult for you to ever move into society. But if you do do this, you will be honored. Um, and Neoptolemus is rather confused, like, 
I'll be honored by doing something dishonorable. And that's an unjust society. So there is natural justice and natural injustice according to which every society can be analyzed, evaluated. Anyway, because of his vulnerability, Neoptolemus agrees to it, partly because he wants to be honored and partly because he needs to be honored. So he goes to Philoctetes and um, he starts having a conversation with him. And it's they, they develop what Philoctetes calls a friendship bond. Um, they are of one mind, noose. They use those, he uses the word noose. So that's Aristotle's paradigm of the highest kind of friendship is that they have a shared mind and they talk about good and evil together. They inspire each other to behave justly and virtuously. Well, what happened, of course, in this case is Neoptolemus was very good at deceiving Philoctetes, um, but he also was very impressed with Philoctetes' character. Um, of course, he felt somewhat sorry for Philoctetes, but Philoctetes started talking about home, his family, his community, and um, Neoptolemus was really impressed by the fact that he was in the presence of a civilized human being, a spudaios, a cultured man, in spite of the fact that he'd been living alone for 10 years and had this sore and had been hurt and wounded. Um, so he was very um, respectful of this old man, which made him even more irritated at Odysseus for what he's being asked to do. The other thing um, that happened was Philoctetes wanted to hear what was going on in the war, who was winning, who was losing, who was dead, who was still alive. And when Neoptolemus told him, it was all the good guys that had died and the bad guys survived. And he didn't think about, neither one of them seemed to think that the reasons the good guys died is they took the risk. They were brave and courageous. And the reason the bad guys survived is they were cowards and they figured out how to get the heck out of there alive. Uh, but they didn't think of it as a function of human will. They thought of it as God's will. Philoctetes was a pious man. He believed in the gods. He trusted the gods. But he had a crisis of faith. He's like, why do the gods do that? Why do they kill the good ones and preserve the bad ones? And he and Neoptolemus had this conversation about, are the gods just? Are they paying attention? What's wrong? And again, Neoptolemus felt a very sorry and a lot of empathy and sympathy for Philoctetes. All right, so then, after a while, um, Philoctetes started to have this wave of pain. So his pain would come in waves. And when that happened, he moaned even more. And then afterwards, he would fall asleep because it was so painful. And um, I've been in situations like this. So I think that's natural for the body to function that way. So when he was fading away, um, going to go to sleep, he handed his bow to Neoptolemus. And Neoptolemus dutifully um, gave it to Odysseus. So Odysseus comes into the scene and sees that Neoptolemus has it, and Neoptolemus gives it to him, but is very confused, um, conflicted about betraying this old man. Um, and then um, uh, Philoctetes wakes up, finds out about the deceit, and really gets angry. He was angry at Odysseus before. Now he's angry at Neoptolemus. He can't trust 
anybody. He thought they were friends. They thought they had a common mind. And all of a sudden, he finds out he's been totally deceived. Um, and then Neoptolemus changes his mind, and he grabs the bow from Odysseus, and he gives it back to Philoctetes. Um, Odysseus, of course, is furious with him, and Philoctetes is furious with him also. So now he's on the bad side of both of them. Um, and Philoctetes will not get on the boat. He doesn't care. He says, I don't care if the Achaeans lose. I don't care. So he's so bitter and so angry, he's going to take revenge by refusing to go to war and not letting the Achaeans win. Okay, so, so then it's an impasse. And there is a deus ex machina. Um, Heracles comes down from the sky and tells Philoctetes, go. <laughs> you know? um, Neoptolemus has been arguing with him, look, you can win the war, you can go home, you can be with your family. Nope, Philoctetes is so bitter and so vengeful. So Heracles intervenes, tells him he needs to get his derriere over on the ship, go to Troy, and finally Philoctetes agrees to do it, and he goes with Neoptolemus. They go as friends, and they Philoctetes does lead the campaign, and the Achaeans do win the war. So that's the plot. Um, so what I want to discuss is how each character exhibits the various virtues and vices in um, Greek, in Aristotle's ethics, and then also what the tragedy is trying to educate uh, people for citizenship, the whole civic context and um, civic education idea behind the, the whole tradition of tragedy. So, when it comes to courage, this particular play is particularly about courage because it's about fear. And um, Philoctetes is um, very much um, possessed by excess fear. He's suffered so much that he's just afraid of everything. Um, so, he overreacts. Um, and especially, of course, when he finds out once again he's been deceived. So his refusal to go, even when every there's every reason for him to go, is an excess not only in fear but especially in anger. That he is definitely at the extreme in relationship to anger. And part of that is his excess of fear. Um, Odysseus, okay, Odysseus is also a coward because he won't um, try to persuade Philoctetes and he sends a young man, Neoptolemus. He corrupts the youth by using them for his own schemes or for his own successes. The other thing he did, which was very poor judgment, was he told the, Gre the Achaeans before he left that if he doesn't bring Philoctetes back, they can kill him, which is way, the, making the stakes way too high. Um, he's going to be a hero. I mean, he, by saying that, he's just saying, I know I'm going to be able to do this. Because, um, of course, he's not going to want to die. So he's, he's just letting them know, you can trust me. I'm going to be able to do this. Well, when he gets there, he's, he's set the bar very high. So all of a sudden, he's really got to manipulate, cajole, force, fraud. He's got to use every possible technique. He misinterprets the oracle. 
he does just about everything because now he's set himself up to to be in a more desperate situation than he really needed to be. Um, uh, so he also um, made a very poor judgment about uh, honor and dishonor. I mean, he decided that he wanted to be honored for bringing Philoctetes back and he would set the bar that high. And he shouldn't do that. There was no need for that because um, that led him to do all sorts of dishonorable things and to corrupt the youth, the old, um, for his own purposes. Neoptolemus, on the other hand, started out exhibiting citizen courage. He, he took a chance or he uh, made this choice because the rulers had asked him to do that and um, he took a risk, a moral risk, of doing what he had been told was not right for the sake of his duty to his leader and his city. Um, but then, afterwards, when he changed his mind, he exhibited moral courage. He took the risk of being ostracized. I mean, that was a high stake decision for him. He could have been permanently ostracized from a meaningful position in the society, and he was the son of Achilles. So that... <laughs> That was, uh, took a lot of moral courage for him to do that. The other issues are pride, honor, and vanity. And this is rational pride is knowing what your contribution to the society is and um, wanting to be honored but not being willing not to be honored. But, but worrying about making sure other people are honored when they do things that promote the well-being of the society so that citizens get signals about what's honorable and dishonorable. In a good society, what, what gets rewarded or punished fits what's naturally honorable and dishonorable. In a bad society, of course, they don't match. So, in this case, um, Neoptolemus really needs to be honored. He needs to be respected by the powerful. And Odysseus uses that as a tool to manipulate him, um, which is really evil because the youth do depend upon their elders and the elders have a lot of power to uh, force them to do things that are wrong because the youth absolutely have to get accepted to survive. Odysseus is vain. He thinks he deserves to be honored a lot more than he does, even when he acts dishonorably. He thinks the end justifies the means. If I achieve the goal, it doesn't matter that I treated an old man and a young man dishonorably. So he's wrong about that. And Philoctetes is, the oracle is saying that he's honorable and he should be honored. And he needs to go to Troy and he will be honored and respected. But uh, he's so bitter that he can't change. I mean, he's lived for so long being dishonored and suffering unjustly even though he was a good person, that he just can't even accept this change in it, what would be his position in society from an outcast to the hero. <laughs> so, um, so he misses the mark on that. He doesn't have the right judgment. He can't change his mind. Uh, he can't see things differently, even though the oracle has given a completely different version of the truth than what he's been living with. Okay, the next one is ambition, rational ambition. Neoptolemus um, 
ha it's rational to want to be ambitious, to want to fit in, gain some professional expertise, become a contributor to society. Um, but when Odysseus asks him to lie to achieve these ambitions, that's he has the right goal, but that would be the wrong way to achieve the goal. Um, and then he, he, he gives that up. And so he changes his ambition. He decides telling the truth is more important than being successful, um, which is difficult. But that was a big um, character builder, character issue. Odysseus, um, when he told the Achaeans they can kill him if he doesn't bring Philoctetes back, that's excess ambition, it's arrogant, um, he assumes he'll be successful at something that you can't control, um, and so he misses the mark in terms of his personal ambition. Um, and Philoctetes is not ambitious enough. He should accept the fact that the city is going to promote him and respect him. And so, um, in relation to anger, that's a big one. Neoptolemus was not angry enough at first. He didn't get angry at Odysseus for telling him to lie. Um, and he, it took him a while to be able to talk back to both Odysseus and Philoctetes. So he didn't get angry enough at first because he deferred to his authorities. But at the end, he did, and he was right, and he told them the truth. Um, Odysseus got too angry, and he demanded blind obedience, and he got out, out, outraged if he didn't get it. And he threatened physical punishment to Neoptolemus besides the loss of any opportunity. So, um, and then he got excessively angry at Philoctetes too. So Odysseus missed the mark in terms of the virtue of even temperedness. And Philoctetes also was too angry. He just couldn't forgive. He couldn't move on. He was just obsessed about holding his grudge and taking revenge. <clears throat> um, truthfulness. Um, Neoptolemus um, thinks he knows less than he does and thinks he is less good than he is, and so he changes his perception of the situation. Um, Odysseus is not truthful about himself. He doesn't know himself. He thinks he's better and wiser than he really is. And Philoctetes is, um, doesn't have self-knowledge. He's just overwhelmed with self-pity and fear and um, just, I mean, he's been living alone for 10 years. He has not, he doesn't have good judgment about his own character and who he is. Um, then Aristotle's importance of friendship and the highest kind of friendship are when two people are bound together by their mind, their noose, and they pursue justice and virtue and truth. They inspire each other. They engage in conversation. They, get, they know each other well, and they um, work together to um, activate activities of soul in accordance with virtue. So, Neoptolemus and Philoctetes develop this friendship and the trouble is you can tell that they could have had a real friendship. Neoptolemus wishes that he could tell him who he really is and what the situation is because he wants to be friends with Philoctetes. Philoctetes is a cultivated person. Odysseus is not. Um, but because of the deception um, it's the friendship is only the appearance of a friendship. Um, they both 
they both believe in the gods and wonder about what's going on. Um, they both have a kind of blind faith, but um, but things change, okay? The, for Philoctetes, finally the gods are just, and the fact that uh, he, a divine intervention finally gets him to do the right thing means that he will lead the troops, he'll be able to go home, um, and he'll have a more sophisticated idea of the will of the gods. He'll understand that a lot of what's called the will of the gods is based on poor judgments by people like Odysseus. In Neoptolemus, the same, he realizes that um, he gives up blind faith, and he realizes that a lot of human events are caused by human choice and bad choices, not by the gods. Um, Odysseus has no friends. He doesn't trust other people. He doesn't have goodwill for either Neoptolemus or Philoctetes. He set up a situation where he has to manipulate and cajole and force people in order to save his own life, which was not necessary to set things up like that. Um, okay. Um, all right. The then the virtues related to justice, being a good citizen. One of them is the distribution of power. Obviously, Odysseus should not have the kind of authority he has. Um, also, the people behind him, the people who are um, holding him accountable, he's always blaming them because he has to do what they say. Um, but especially, again, since he said, you can kill me if I don't come back. I don't think the people, other people thought that was necessary, but, and that was really an important part of the problem here. So Odysseus has too much power, and he is discredited by the end of the play. Philoctetes at the beginning has too little respect and power and by the end of the play, he's going to have an appropriate amount. And Neoptolemus is making a transition from having too little to beginning to be able to make the judgments. And if he, he continues to be able to hit the mark and make good judgments, he'll eventually be able to exercise power and exercise it well if the society is just. Um, the justice in relation to rectifying wrongs and returning a situation to equilibrium. Um, Philoctetes is so angry that he refuses to do, to choose to do the thing that will rectify the wrongs. Uh, rectify the wrong of Paris stealing Helen and winning the war rectify the wrong of the way he's been treated in the past. He doesn't, he has a chance to bring things back to equilibrium for him, for his society, and he refuses. <laughs> that was terrible. Um, uh, Neoptolemus, by the end, does make the judgment that will rectify the wrong, and Odysseus um, never does get it. He, he um, ends up bringing them to Troy, but he doesn't change his mind. Um, the virtue of equity is the ability to apply the laws in a certain situation. In this case, the ability to interpret the oracle. Um, okay, the oracle said Philoctetes has to come with his bow willingly. Okay, so what does equity require that you figure out uh, what you can and can't do to achieve that goal. And um, Odysseus is wrong, and Neoptolemus is right. Um, he judges both the other characters correctly. He tells them that they're wrong and why they're wrong. Um, so, oh, then there's the question of excellence in deliberation. When they 
that is where you set out what the all the options are and you choose one and you do it for the right reason if you have excellence in it you'll choose the right one and you'll achieve that goal in the right way for the right reason at the right time odysseus has three choices force fraud or persuasion he chooses the wrong means he has the right goal to get philoctetes to come but he even inter misinterprets uh, what he really has to do then he makes the wrong choice he chooses fraud then he does it in the wrong way by forcing a young person to lie um, so he his calculations he fails in many different character aspects of the virtue of excellence in, dis in deliberation. Um, all three of the characters have opinions, and they have good opinions, and they have part of the truth, but some are better than others. And Neoptolemus, at the end, is the one who embodies the truth. He is the truth. So the person of practical wisdom is the truth in the situation. Um, Neoptolemus has what's called understanding because he judge, judges other people's lives and choices well, even if he doesn't have power. He, he, doesn't, he can't motivate either one of them to change, but luckily the God intervenes and he does change. Um, people do change. The thing about um, why I think the tragedy is called Philoctetes is because Philoctetes made this mistake in judgment of, of having this grudge and not letting go of his grudge. <coughs> and because of that, in a sense, Odysseus was right, right? You couldn't persuade him. So, so Odysseus then doesn't look so bad. What could he do if Philoctetes is not going to go willingly? Um, the thing about it, though, even though Odysseus' persuasion was going to be a really tough sell, Odysseus did all these other things that were really, he kept going too far, going to too much of an extreme in figuring out how to to get Philoctetes to come. Um, then there's the difference between having knowledge of the facts and knowing what's best, what you should do in the situation. Um, Philoctetes at the end, everybody's got all the facts. Philoctetes still doesn't want to go. Odysseus still wants to force him to go. Neoptolemus um, wants him to go willingly. And so Heracles, the deus ex machina, has to come in there and really force the issue um, and persuade Philoctetes. He's finally persuaded, but you have to have this deus ex machina. And so the reason why it's, that it's called Philoctetes, is even though at the end everything's happy, um, that's just because everybody knows that, yes, Philoctetes goes in the end. But the way the play is written, truly, he never chooses. He never really willingly goes. It takes a deus ex machina. And so the average Joe doesn't have a divine intervention at the critical point. So the lesson is for the rest of us that we should actually choose to change. Um, that Philoctetes was an intermediate character, okay? So all three of them are portrayed in a way that you could identify with them. Um, and all three of them make mistakes. So let's, um, so I'm going to now, the next thing is to just go through the list of Aristotle's criteria of patterns and tragedy and explain how this play fits the pattern. Um, it has unity of plot, character, and action. It's definitely an archetype. 
So you have the archetype of the youth coming of age, trusting his authority figures, and then having to make that transition from listening to other people to um, making your own choices. Now, when young people go through that transition, they don't have to have had the experience of being deceived or um, having authority figures that make poor judgments. They could actually, in a just society, it's a much more smooth process. Um, Odysseus is the archetype of the middle-aged person who exercises power, and every everyone in middle age makes many decisions, um, and they always have to confront this problem of, does the end justify the means? And this comes up again and again, and I think they're always deliberating about, well, what about in this case? <laughs> what? Uh, how sketchy can we be? Um, and Odysseus really makes a lot of poor judgments in the case. It wasn't an easy case. None of the cases in tragedy are easy. But Odysseus just misjudged in a lot of different ways. And he never apologized. He never seemed to learn anything. He never, he just uh, made mistakes. And then um, Philoctetes is a good archetype for an old person because by the time people get old, they have suffered unjustly. And that's just because human, the human condition is vulnerable. Many things happen. Many of them are accidents. Um, yeah, I mean, stepping on Artemis turf was an accident and he suffered. Okay, so somebody gets up in the morning, walks across the street, gets hit by a car, right? It's a total accident, and he suffers physically the rest of his life. And then his, his friends might say, well, it must be God's will, right? You're, you're punishing, you did something bad. I mean, it's ridiculous, but it happens. Um, so it's a paradigm for old people not letting themselves be consumed by fear, bitterness, grudges, um, and just wanting to not live, wanting to hide away and be left alone. Um, whereas an older person who has suffered, who's been through a lot, will inspire the, their grandchildren. Every older person will, can inspire their grandchildren and say, okay, you think life is difficult. Let me tell you a few stories. This is just the way it is. And so if the grandchildren or that whole generation um, looks up to their grandparents, which this would be the soldiers. The soldiers are the young people, people in their 20s, maybe early 30s, and Philoctetes is old, that the old folks in the front lines will inspire the young and make them realize life is complicated, it's difficult, it involves dangers, um, some of them accidental, just because we're vulnerable by nature. And then there's the fact that you happen to live at a time when your country goes to war and all these other things that happen. So um, it's an archetype about not going to an extreme, uh, the likely, the common kinds of extremes that old people go to. Um, the play has a beginning, a middle, and end. It's very well organized so that it's definitely not just a historical event. It's a type of event so that when you think about the play, you're not thinking about history. You're, you're using your mind. You're thinking about patterns. It's about patterns. And so you have in your mind um, the pattern a definition of the pattern so that you can apply it in a situation. You can meet up with an old person, a middle-aged person, a young person, and you can say, oh, they're going through this, this transition or this temptation or this extreme, and, they're, and they need to recognize every human being either has been through this or could be through this, could go through this. It's part of the human condition. And once they understand that, 
and there's better and worse ways to deal with it, they can make better choices. So the tragedy is supposed to educate people about the human condition, about the kinds of situations you're going to get into, your family, your friends, about the kind of choices you should make or shouldn't make. It's a serious issue. The characters are closely related and they belong to the ruling families and in this case also their fellow citizens. So again, the stakes are high for Odysseus because he's a ruling, because he has power. The stakes are high for Neoptolemus because he belongs to a family that is one of the ruling families. He can't be very difficult for him to fail <laughs> to find a spot in society. It's also about um, not just the uh, a group of families, but when they're acting as citizens, when they're ruling. Um, and so you're trying to educate everyone in the audience about citizenship and how to act as a good citizen. Um, they're all, the characters are all good in some sense. Um, they're true to type, the way it's, the way the play's written, um, and they're consistent, <laughs> um, except that Neoptolemus changes. So, but the archetype of coming of age is a consistent archetype um, of making that transition. They all have an idea of the good that causes them to make the choices. It's just that um, it might be the wrong means to an end. It might be the wrong idea of the good, but they're all driven by some idea of the good. They all have good opinions, as Aristotle said, but their weakness in character causes them to misapply a principle or to um, draw from the wrong principle or somehow to miss the mark, to make poor judgment. Um, the characters are, I would say, well, Aristotle says better, worse, and intermediate. Well, in some ways Odysseus is worse than average. In some ways um, Neoptolemus, I guess, would come as across as better. And in some ways Philoctetes is intermediate. But I would argue that we can all empathize with all of them. Um, so there is this notion of um, identification with the characters. And I think people can understand Odysseus's quandary. They can also recognize that he sort of is pretty nasty um, and pretty unwilling to compromise and gets incredibly angry at Neop when he's not being obeyed and things like that, but you can empathize with the difficulties of people with power trying to figure out um, if the end justifies the means, especially in certain difficult situations. Um, you can identify with Neoptolemus. Everyone should be able to identify with him. Um, sometimes coming-of-age experiences are not like that. Sometimes the character, the young person, is not as um, doesn't have as much goodwill as Neoptolemus. Um, sometimes they rebel or they reject their elders for the wrong reason. Neoptolemus does it for the right reason. Sometimes the coming of age does not include being asked by your elders to do something wrong. Um, but in general, people should be able to understand that. And then Philoctetes in particular, every older person should be able to understand that unjust suffering and the possibility of holding a grudge or wanting to run away from life because you've suffered too much. You know, we're too vulnerable. But it does give you strength in the face of knowledge of vulnerability. Um, all of them, it includes thought, the play includes thought. They all explain why they're doing what they're doing. But they all use speech either to tell the truth or to manipulate. So again, you see the power of speech to either um, cultivate wisdom or manipulate and deceive and delude. <laughs> uh, so speech is powerful. They all suffer. Philoctetes suffers. Um, 
due to just accidents, due to just the vulnerability of the human condition. And that's why he would be an inspiration if he can get over it. Um, Neoptolemus suffers because the youth are dependent on their um, elders and um, they can't survive without social acceptance. And so he suffers because he needs it and yet the price is too high. And then Odysseus suffers by choice because of the choices he makes. He's just not a good leader. Um, all right. The, okay, the plot leads, to, um, people make this transition from happiness to misery because of a mistake in judgment. Okay, well, the thing about the play is everybody knows it's going to end happily. So um, Sophocles can't go there, but I think the way it's written, it's very insightful because um, Sophocles is clearly saying, look, um, if Philoctetes had really done what he wanted to, everyone would be miserable. Um, and it took this intervention, but you know what? You people who are watching the play, that's not going to happen. So don't wait around for a day of sex mahina. Change your mind. Um, there's a reversal and recognition from ignorance to wisdom. Okay, Neoptolemus makes the transition. Um, Odysseus never learns anything, but the audience can. And then um, Philoctetes, uh, you know, does he really change his mind or he just goes along. It's not like he has this wonderful inner <laughs> change revelation. It's an external revelation. Um, okay, so it's hard to believe either Odysseus or Philoctetes did not learn much, but Neoptolemus clearly learns a lot. Um, okay, there's the pathos, a catharsis of pity and fear, or pathos and phobos. So um, everyone should be able to pity the characters or identify with them and um, their situation and fear for the fact that I could do that. I could get uh, fearful. I could hold grudges. I could hide away when I get old. I don't want to do that. I could exercise power and abuse people and corrupt people and justify it by the end is justifies the means. Um, I went through a coming of age experience. How does that compare to Neoptolemus? Um, I could have turned out better for it or worse for it. Um, so everyone should be able to identify with the characters, learn from the characters, from their strengths, their weaknesses, um, and see that their patterns, almost every line in the play people should be able to identify with. Um, and then the catharsis is an emotional education. In the end, um, people should have the courage to live what Aristotle calls a complete life, to take on coming of age and to try to do it well, to take on authority and to try to do it well. Don't do what Odysseus did. It's tempting to do that. It's tempting to misinterpret the goal. It's tempting to put yourself on the line because you want to be a hero. It's tempting to manipulate other people. Don't do it. Find another way. And then um, also the courage to live a full life, even when you're older, even if you've suffered, because that's just the human condition. We will all suffer. So um, finally, the cont text of the tragedy that they were shown to um, all the ci citizens and I think the slaves came. I mean, it was a religious festival. Everybody got to watch. The people voted on which set of plays they liked better. But the point is that if you want a society of self-governing citizens, you want a society where people rule and are ruled in turn, these are all very important lessons. These are the mistakes the character makes are all obstacles to being able to develop and maintain this wonderful image 
goal of the free, um, self-regulating, self-sustaining, self-governing society that doesn't need authority figures. If the old run away and hide, somebody's going to have to fill in the gap. Somebody has to inspire the youth. If middle-aged people abuse their power, the city will suffer. If young people have a coming of age that corrupts them, there's going to be problems. So um, now Neoptolemus comes across as a very good guy, but you know, having to do this bad thing. And then in the next play, I'm going to talk about Hecuba. Again, he's asked to do something even worse uh, as his civic duty. And, of, and we know that ne the story of Neoptolemus is that he eventually becomes a pretty corrupt, rotten guy. But if you think about it, um, if these stories are representative, the story is also about how the city um, kept expecting him to do rotten things. And so he went from being having good intentions, wanting to represent his family, to um, becoming a pretty, the end justif justifies the means, uh, a pretty nasty guy. Um, so that's my take on the Philoctetes. Mostly people would watch the play and then they'd go to the taverna and they'd have a wonderful conversation like I've just had and I certainly wish there were more people <laughs> and I could talk to them. But hopefully I plant some seeds you can call me, email me, or preferably find somebody else to talk to. So maybe someone would want to use my video as a starting point or parts of it, right? Watch five minutes and then get into a conversation because it's the conversations people get in with each other where the learning starts to take place. I mean, really, we need dialogues. We need to be able to have someone who will make many distinctions and uh, help us constantly think through because the situations, because situations of practical wisdom are very difficult and complicated. And it's good to talk to somebody about every aspect of them and get in the habit of developing, um, well, being educated about human choices and developing the character trait of understanding so that eventually you would be able to use your power of choice wisely because we do have that power and we're responsible for how we use it. <laughs>